Good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to our panel discussion dealing with the expectations for the Berlin Process Summit uh, 2021. My name is Simonida Kacarska. I run the European Policy Institute in Skopje, and I was kindly asked by the organizers, the Aspen Institute and Zodosta Europa Gesellschaft, to moderate today's uh, session with our high level speaker, the State Secretary at the German Federal Foreign Office, Miguel Berger, who I'm very grateful. Uh, for his participation. During this panel, we will uh, hear what was discussed over the two days uh, over the, on the working groups. We will hear the policy recommendations as well as the expectations from uh, the Berlin Process Summit. Uh, we have designated rapporteurs that uh, will uh, report from all of the 10 working groups that have been working hard over the last two days, uh, which means that we have a lot of uh, topics to cover. But uh, first, to start off the discussion, I will give the State Secretary a couple of minutes for his welcoming uh, remarks, thanking him again, because this for us from civil society is one of the most important sessions where we bring our uh, recommendations directly uh, to the policymakers. State Secretary, the floor is yours. So I hope you can hear me. Wonderful. Excellent, yeah. So, Ms. Kaczaska, thank you, thank you very much for the for the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to to be here in this virtual uh, meeting with you. And uh, uh, if I understand it correctly, this is the last panel of uh, the one and a half days, you or two days of work um, in the civil society and and think tank forum. And and really great thanks to to all the participants for, for their contributions. And I'm really looking forward to uh, listen to the, to the uh, outcome, to the results of the, of the, different, of the different working groups. And um, so also a big thanks to, to Aspen Institute, to Germany, uh, to the Südost Europa Gesellschaft, the Southeast Europe Association for the joint organization of, of the forum. And as you know, this uh, civil society think tank forum marks the beginning um, of this year's round of, of the Berlin process meetings, um, something we started uh, seven years um, ago with the Berlin process. And the objective is and, and has been to, to unlock, I would say, the potential um, uh, of the region to strengthen the connectivity but above all to strengthen a regional, regional cooperation. And um, from the beginning, our intention has been not to have only, I would say, academic discussions on, on topics, but to create a, a real impact, a real impact uh, on the ground and to, and to give um, answer to questions uh, about uh, everybody's life uh, and, and people's uh, life and how to improve that uh, concretely. And if, if we look back uh, the last seven years, I think there are some areas where we have uh, achieved something um, really visible, um, the creation of the, the youth cooperation, some very important infrastructure projects, uh, the commitment to the common regional market uh, that was done last year, uh, although we still have some challenges in the in the implementation, and in our view, this this Berlin process is also really about about ownership. Um, that it's necessary that everybody has to understand that it's their task also to to drive the issues uh, forward. And I think regional cooperation, um, for example, the moderation with the Regional Cooperation Council, and I just talked to the, I think she's called Secretary General of the RCC. I talked with her some days ago on where we stand on the implementation. And I would say progress is slow, but I really hope that we can give some of the issues a push um, uh, when I think about uh, the free travel of people with ID cards, I think that's a basic, a basic issue. 
the unified visa area, um, the recognition of academic and professional uh, qualifications, all of these issues would have a, a real impact. And there is one issue which was also widely discussed in the European Union during the pandemic, which is the question of the so-called green lanes, which allow <clears throat> traffic to, to move forward despite maybe some COVID regulations. And, and also here, I think we still need to need to make, make some progress. And um, so in our view, um, this question of, of people to people cooperation, which is crucial, uh, give new economic perspectives, especially after the pandemic. If I think about the brain drain from the region, which is really uh, a serious, I would say, also impediment for, for the further development. So it shows that we need to, to do something there. And then issues we always take up, uh, uh, free and diverse media, uh, minority rights, which need to be assured, the space for civil society and, and, and NGOs. And, um, let me underline here to, to all participants that the Civil Society Forum is for us uh, much, much more than a side event uh, of the process. In, in our view, this is really a key pillar. Um, and uh, so the ideas, the ideas which come out uh, of the discussion, um, they will be presented and discussed uh, with the foreign ministers in their meeting on the on the 8th of June, which is something I think very, very positive. And I have seen that you have set yourself a really an ambitious agenda with these, te with these 10 workshops and, and some of the very pertinent uh, topics. So really let us see how we can move forward uh, together. And uh, now I'm very interested uh, to, to listen to the outcome of, of your deliberations. Thank you, Secretary Berger. Thank you very much for mentioning the ownership because I think that what we're about to hear in this panel is specifically the view from uh, the region and from some of the activists that have been um, working on these topics for a very long period of time. Just a couple of housekeeping remarks after those uh, inspiring uh, words. We will work in four clusters for uh, this session. So we've organized the 10 groups in uh, four clusters. And I would kindly ask uh, the colleagues who are presenting, who I will announce, to turn on their cameras when they are uh, speaking. Uh, after each of the clusters, I will give an opportunity to Secretary Berger to respond to any immediate uh, um, questions. And then at the end, let's hope that we will have enough time for uh, discussion. Each of the speakers will have five minutes, and I was told that I need to be very strict on that. Uh, the first group uh, will, that will present uh, brings the summary of the results of the group on the future of the EU in the Western Balkans, the role of civil society in strengthening democracy and countering disinformation and strengthening media independence. Uh, first, I will give the floor to Milana Lazarevic from the Think for Europe Network and the Center for European Policy in Belgrade to update us on the discussions on the future of the EU in the Western Balkans. Milana, Please do turn on your camera and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, my dear Simonida, State Secretary uh, Berger. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this opportunity. So um, in our working group over the, over the course of yesterday and today, um, the discussion has focused mainly on the role of the um, European Union and its member states which unfortunately is clearly showing that civil society has rather low expectations from national governments in the Western Balkans and is really pleading for help from EU partners in fulfilling its controlling mission, but also its mission of substantively supporting the EU accession uh, of the region. Yet we have, uh, uh, we have uh, come up with recommendations to uh, the EU, to the civil society organizations themselves and to the Western Balkan governments. Uh, to start with the recommendations towards uh, EU institutions and member states. Well, first of all, um, outstanding issues, which are now dubbed as bilateral issues currently blocking the enlargement process for certain Western Balkan countries, should be reframed as issues affecting the entire foreign and enlargement policies of the European Union, and thus no longer be tolerated as bilateral issues. 
Uh, the EU should also be coherent and consistent in communications on all levels, from the technical to the highest political level, avoiding glorification of national political elites when it is not merited, and where there are clear rule of law, human rights, and or democracy problems on the ground. The EU should revise its approach to monitoring progress and level of preparedness by developing a coherent quantified assessment methodology that would be applied in the same way to all candidates and potential candidates. Uh, it should also maximize transparency of the enlargement policy and consequently help the transparency of the accession processes of our countries and civil society's efforts to monitor the process as well as reduce executive bias in the process by strengthening the role of parliaments and civil societies, even judiciaries in the process. The EU should also reform its funding schemes to make them work more from the bottom up and thus help avoid inadvertently entrenched uh, state capture. It should also ensure continued engagement with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo and maintain their EU perspective while keeping in line with the spirit of the new negotiation strategy. The EU should also tap the full potential of differentiated integration in further developing and rethinking its approach to enlargement, albeit ensuring that the finalité of the process remains full membership and offering Western Balkan countries the option of phased membership rather than imposing it. The EU should also develop an all-encompassing approach towards better integrating the Western Balkans into its policies aimed at strengthening Europe's strategic autonomy. And last but not least, the EU should include the region to a greater extent in its conference on the future of, the, of Europe. To civil society organizations, first of all, we recommend to continue and step up uh, the demands for our own meaningful inclusion in the accession process and negotiations, as well as full transparency of the process. We should also engage deeply in monitoring reforms on the ground and proactively advocate results and findings of such monitoring to both our governments and EU institutions and member states, but also communicate and engage more proactively with the public uh, in our countries on these issues. We should engage in deeper and wider regional collaboration, peer learning, as well as help uh, thus help creating positive peer pressure among governments by benchmarking performances across the region. We should engage in wider and deeper collaboration with civil society from EU member states. To our national governments, we recommend, first of all, to refrain from using negative and destructive political rhetoric towards the EU and in the integration process, at least as long as the formal and written national strategic objective is achievement of EU membership. Political discourse towards the EU needs to be in line with those objectives. In countries with positive discourse, communication needs to be improved and more substantive, focusing also on the social dimension of the process. National parliaments should be given a greater role in the accession and negotiation procedures and should be invited to regularly discuss and monitor implementation of recommendations from the EU progress reports. The national governments should commit alongside the EU institutions and member states to full transparency of the EU integration processes and procedures as EU accession is not a mere negotiation on an international agreement, but a process of deep societal and governmental transformation that affects us all. And finally, the government should be more proactive in creating and pushing for joint regional initiatives related to the advancement of the EU accession process, thus amplifying the voice of the region towards the EU in recognition of the common interest of integrating the region fully into the union. Thank you very much. And I'm open for any questions or comments. Thank you, Milana, and thank you for sticking to the time. Uh, it was quite refreshing to start with the future of the EU in uh, of the EU in the Western Balkans. Um, this is probably the discussion on those fundamentals that we are discussing, but including the, the our European future as well. The second uh, speaker is Misha Popovic from the Institute for Democracy, uh, Societas Civilis who's going to update us on the role of civil society in strengthening democracy. Nisha, your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Simonida, State Secretary Berger. Uh, we would like to stress that uh, economic cooperation and convergence cannot precede the democratic infrastructure, and we cannot disentangle these two processes. Uh, the countries are interdependent in multitude of ways, and problems in democracy in one country affect the progress in others. Uh, this functionality in the institutions creates a spiral for supporting quick fixes delivered by political strongmen who often disregard the democratic or the due process in the decision-making. So, COVIDocracy is but the latest 
embodiment of such practices, where checks and balances are replaced by the hand of strong or resolute uh, leaders. So in a situation where less democratic shortcuts in governance are in favor, civil society operates in a difficult and often hostile environment in some countries slowly being pushed out of the public space. But the role of civil society is to find ways and contribute to democratization by advocating in favor of its constituents. It needs to reinforce these bonds and acquire new avenues of drawing its leg legitimacy and stimulate demand among citizens for better governance. So CS, uh, civil society needs to change the narratives and have more direct relationships with the citizens, talk more with citizens before talking with governments. This means mutual engagement between grassroots capacity builders, watchdogs and think tanks about issues that have tangible importance to the everyday life of citizens, like issues of environment or healthcare. By working together, they can secure victories against established corrupt interests and autocrats. We need also to work on planting the seeds for the next generation of activists. They find ways to engage citizens outside of the established civil society, so we need to build their capacity and enable them to have more impact. These new initiatives situated in the communities can safeguard against the growing effect of civic disengagement, rise of extreme and populist groups, which seemingly act in popular interest. As CSOs, we need to build solid information platforms and communication paradigms where CSOs can overcome media barriers and disinformation and directly engage citizens and build their demand for the important issues. Without citizens, we cannot put sustainable pressure against the political establishment. So to succeed in this, the EU needs to adjust the assistance to the civil society and invest in organizations instead of projects. The EU assistant, assistance is currently the most administrative burdensome aid scheme in the Western Balkans. CSOs need flexible support to adapt to the continuously changing political space and not spend time to complete projects which in the meantime might be less important than ongoing issues. The EU and the member states must be guided by values while engaging the region and should provide the necessary means for CSOs to operate preserving these values first before going on to cooperate and work with governments on institution building, which is the current ongoing paradigm of the EU engagement uh, with the Western Balkan civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Misha, uh, for being to the point and being on time as well. Our last speaker in this cluster is Nikola Burazer from the Center for Contemporary Politics in Belgrade. He is going to update us on what the working group dealing with countering disinformation and strengthening media independence worked on. Nicola, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Simonida. Um, I have the honor to present the recommendations from this working group, um, and I believe the topics we have touched upon are quite of big importance uh, in the Western Balkans, also for other questions such as democratization and uh, regional cooperation. Uh, let me begin by assessing, uh, or let's say, uh, by, by uh, mentioning here the problems which we have found to be the most pressing ones in the Western Balkans that the governments need to deal with. The first question is the question of transparency of ownership and financing, and maybe one of the fundamental problems when it comes to functioning of media in the Western Balkans. The second is the question of the role of the state in the media sphere and uh, the funding coming from the state, but also other ways the state regulates uh, the media and the importance of limiting the role of the state and basically putting the state uh, in, this, in a situation where it is going to support media's uh, reporting in the public interest and establishing core uh, conditions for a fair media market. Of course, uh, what's the problem is uh, the, the lack of rule of law when it comes to uh, implementation of, of legal provisions on media, and this is certainly something that needs to be improved. Now we come to uh, uh, two very important questions. Uh, one is the uh, independence and capacity of the public broadcasters 
uh, which uh, often lack independence and uh, lack capacities to to uh, to fulfill their designated roles and uh, both funding uh, uh, and independence of the public broadcasters needs to be improved in order for them to fulfill their designated role. The second is the question of uh, the media regulatory bodies, which have very wide competences in different Western Balkan countries, uh, but which uh, often lack both independence and financial capacities to fulfill this, this role. And we, we want to accentuate this particular problem as very important for the entire region. Then, of course, you have the problem of attacks on journalists and threats against journalists, sometimes coming from the government themselves. In that sense, the governments must refrain from attacking journalists and labeling them as political opponents. Uh, but also the appropriate institutions need to promptly deal with the questions of attacks on journalists and media as a matter of priority. And all prior cases of murders of journalists should be resolved as soon as possible. Of course, the problem of media literacy is also of uh, big importance, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the problem of disinformation, which is plaguing the entire region. And the state should also be involved in uh, resolving this, uh, uh, this problem. Now, when it comes to the role of the EU and how the EU can, can, can support uh, media freedom and help fight disinformation in the region, we have two, let's say, sets of recommendations. The first ones are of general nature. So what can the EU do systematically to help this problem? Well, we believe that the EU should uh, be more vocal about the importance of media freedom in the Western Balkans and should not refrain from naming and shaming of governments. The second is that the EU should design new instruments to monitor and assess media freedom, such as the special reports on media freedom, similarly to as uh, currently exists for chapters 23 and 24. And also when it comes to uh, cases of serious problems with media freedom, which may result in political crisis, the EU should commission senior expert group reports on media freedom in a similar fashion as was done with the rule of law in North Macedonia with the so-called Pribe report, and then later on insist on meaningful improvements uh, uh, of the questions assessed within the report. When it comes to more specific ways that the EU and the member states can help media freedom in the Western, in the Western Balkans directly, uh, for sure there is a question of uh, financially supporting independent media. And uh, what is definitely important is uh, that the EU should uh, help Western Balkan media uh, create sustainable business models, but also directly finance them during the transition period as the implementation of new business models is not possible in the short term. Also, uh, the EU and the member states uh, should uh, especially focus on supportive, uh, support investigative journalists, uh, young journalists, women journalists, and local and minority media, which are increasingly threatened around the region. Also, the EU should uh, definitely uh, uh, focus on supporting media literacy programs as a means to, to help fight disinformation uh, in, in the region. And the civil society also has a big role uh, to play in this regard. And of course, finally, the EU should support the civil society and the links between the media and the civil society, as well as regional media uh, cooperation to fight disinformation uh, in the region. And last but not least, the EU and the member states uh, should support uh, media self-regulation mechanisms, which is something which is currently underdeveloped in the Western Balkans and should be worked on by the civil society, but it surely needs uh, EU support. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you to all three speakers uh, from this cluster of working groups. Secretary Berger, would you like to respond immediately to any of the issues? Yeah, uh, with, with pleasure and, and really thanks to, to the three of you. I think you touched upon very, very important uh, topics. I wanted to ask if what you have presented will also be, be uh, presented in, in writing because there were many ideas yes. and obviously we have to condensate everything everything a lot. And if, if I start with, with the last point, disinformation, uh, yes, this is, you know, to strengthen the resilience against disinformation is also a topic here. I can tell you with the upcoming German elections, we see a lot of disinformation activity, which is going on and, and to strengthen the resilience here is, is crucial. And I take your point which I think is really important to say the EU should be more vocal, not only on that, on, on media, but also to have a kind of monitoring mechanism. 
um, maybe we should here look also to the OECE in Vienna because they have uh, one of the institutions in the OECE is on media and on journalists and against attacks uh, on journalists. And I think that this is also an instrument we, we, we have to use. And uh, uh, absolutely crucial, the question of public broadcasters, the question of state media, the role of the state uh, overall in the media sector. Because as we all know, it's extremely difficult to develop civil society and, and, and bring democracy forward if the media sector is not pluralistic and is not free. So uh, very much uh, supportive on, on what you said. And I also take very serious the points on civil society. And you know, for us, the interaction with civil society is, 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 is a day-to-day -day work here in our ministry. On many, many topics, we, we exchange views with civil society. And obviously, civil society organizations need to be based on, on real citizen support. Uh, but if that is guaranteed, I think then they are also a valid interlocutor for, for governments. And I see with concern what you said about civil society being, being pushed out uh, of, of many debates and the, the areas you mentioned, environment, health, many, many areas where I think that civil society can play can play a leading role. Yes, and and uh, Ms. Lazarevich, I think you will have the, uh, the, the possibility to speak to ministers uh, directly, which is great. And my recommendation would be really re uh, bring these points also to them. And I agree with what you said, that bilateral issues should not be allowed to stop uh, progress. And, you know, under our German presidency, we did a lot, for example, uh, to try to bridge differences uh, between uh, northern Macedonia and Bulgaria in order to, to move the process forward. Um, uh, this should not be tolerated, and I, I, I agree with that. And I can't answer really the question about the role of parliaments, but I'm how strong that is, but I share the point. And I can tell you here in Germany, the role of parliament is very strong. So parliament is fully involved in the whole discussion, for, for example, on EU enlargement, uh, on accession talks, all of that is a debate which is, which is very intensively taking place. Um, Conference of the Future of Europe, yes. Um, and I, I, th this is our objective, to include the whole of the Western Balkans into the discussion uh, of the Conference of the Future of Europe and also on, on strategic autonomy. We have to see how we can organize it, maybe with one or two other EU member states, but we are really keen to organize civil society conference on, on, on the future of Europe, which includes the Western Balkans. So thank you also for for your recommendations. Thank you, uh, State Secretary. I would like to thank the three speakers from our first cluster, and I would like to invite our second cluster of working groups, which deals with addressing legacies of the past and regional confidence building and acceptance and rights of minorities in the Western Balkans. We will first uh, start with Group A, uh, with Branka Vierda from the Youth Initiative for Human Rights from Croatia and Marko Milosavljevic from the Youth Initiative from, for Human Rights from Serbia. Branka and Marko have kindly agreed to share those five minutes. So uh, Branka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Simonida. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, respected State Secretary, Mr. Berger and respected audience. A uh, working group addressing legacies of the past and regional confidence building created recommendations which will Youth Initiative for Human Rights present. First of all, recommendations for CSOs and think tanks from the Western Balkans. Uh, since uh, regional confidence building is a slow, intense and long-term process, CSOs and think tanks must work hard to develop new approaches in order to contribute to reconciliation processes and sustainable peace in this region. 
One way to achieve this is through multidisciplinary cooperation between different types of NGOs, which nurture human rights in the area and understand how important it is to raise human rights standards and grassroots initiatives from local areas which have direct experience in fieldwork. Strong cooperation between CSOs and think tanks must be extended by adding new types of partners, such as academic institutions, having in mind that the role and expertise of CSOs in this area is strictly focused on truth seeking processes. The availability of facts and data is a necessary condition for strong and relevant advocacy. Marco. Uh, thank you, Branka. Uh, thank you, State Secretary and dear Simona. So recommendation for uh, Western Balkan governments is that actually we are expecting that reconciliation and development of sustainable peace must be perceived as a issue of importance both on the national and uh, on the regional level. Therefore, the countries belonging to the region, including Croatia and Slovenia and also Albania should strongly support close cooperation. What we accepting is the um, that uh, especially Croatia needs to take a leadership role in, in reconciliation process, not contra. Um, and uh, also uh, what we, uh, in order to create uh, multilateral public policies and reconciliation agendas, which will comprehensively uh, represent the recognition of the importance and strong commitment to fostering social development and strong values uh, and responsible dealing with the past. Uh, secondly, uh, independent media are the crucial partner in the processes of uh, responsible dealing with the past. Therefore, a strong support for critical journalism and the protection of freedom of speech is at most importance in providing the public with uncensored information about the atrocities and the human rights violations that occurred during the recent conflicts in the region and unaddressed uh, human rights violation from preceding regimes. Also, one way to contribute, not just uh, mutual education, but also multicultural cooperation uh, could be a regional exchange of the journalists. And uh, on the end, the recommendation for the uh, EU and the member states, they need to provide uh, targeted grants for uh, cross-border and regional programs, including, as I said, Croatia, Slovenia, and Albania to support joint reconciliation and peace building activities. Grant should support the culture of uh, accountability and social cohesion. Also, impose zero tolerance for hate speech and attacks on peace activists and the media. This would include uh, withholding financial, political, and operational support uh, to candidate states by European institutions and the member states. Also, the EU policy of conditionality towards candidate states should encompass transitional and also restorative justice mechanism. In conjunctions with uh, criminal justice mechanisms, include non-judicial dimensions of DJ, which is actually forgotten, such as reparation, truth-seeking, and memorization during the monitoring period. And on the end, it's crucial that this process is followed by concrete, sincere, active, and effective push by national institutions to truly recognize and develop public policies that are oriented towards peace building. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, our second uh, rapporteur is Suad Skenderi from the Institute for Research and Policy Analysis from Elitico who will update us on what was discussed in the working group on acceptance and rights of minorities in the Western Balkans. So what the floor is yours. Thank you, Simonida. Honorable State Secretary Berger, thank you for joining in. Uh, it is crucial for us and the working group uh, to be part of this uh, process. I'd like to um, list the recommendations uh, from the uh, working group on acceptance and social inclusion of minorities in the western balkans so first i go to the recommendations for cso's and the think tanks from the western balkans mobilization and engagement of minorities to participate in times of elections accountability of institutions which are responsible for implementation of the poznan declaration and the eu strategic framework 
the digital agenda funds should ensure internet access to all of the Roma settlements in the Western Balkans. Educate the Roma community about e-services since governments are working on a common project for provision of online services. Targeted field approach towards minorities for immunization in order to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. So I move to the recommendations for Western Balkan governments. Mainstream political parties should enable space for minorities to participate in elections as their candidates, at their structures and decision-making processes. Safeguard freedom of political expression in Western Balkans, especially for minorities due to their isolation and the existing tokenism. Tailor employment measures and vocational trainings for minorities in accordance to the market demands in order to maximize the potential of the workforce. Western Balkan countries and the economic actors have to support Roma informal gray economy to transit, to transit towards the green economy. Mentorship of Roma graduates for Roma students in order to overcome the COVID-19 crisis. Digital education must be an objective of the digital agenda for involvement of the Roma children and ensuring access of digital online continuous education. Monitor and sanction discrimination from the health institutions and staff uh, towards the Roma patients when they go for checkups or other health services. Establish instruments to allow vulnerable groups to access the EU funds and ensure that minorities participate in the process of planning. Increase the trust of Roma in public institutions to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Western Balkan countries should collect data for the purposes of the Poznan Declaration, as well as the level of vaccinated against the COVID-19. Western Balkan uh, governments should use the potential and the capacities from the business sector and the CSOs. Utilize the opportunities to take advantage of the Western Balkans investment framework in order to improve the situation of Roma, especially in the construction of social housing. According to the UNHCR pledges and the Poznan Declaration, Western Balkan countries should ensure civil registration for minorities by 2024, safeguarding the infrastructure in the Roma settlements, such as the access to electricity and water supply. Minorities should engage in the reforestation process in order to mitigate the climate change consequences and the negative environmental impact. Um, the recommendations for the EU and its member states. The European Union and Germany as allies to the minorities should invest efforts in political assistance in the Western Balkans, especially to minority participation and decision-making positions and processes. The European Union should monitor the implementation of the national laws in the Western Balkans, especially the laws covering the promotion uh, of the minority rights. Although EU efforts have resulted with progress, still the EU must monitor the anti-gypsism and make sure that no one is left behind. And the last but not the least, the EU should initiate operationalization of the Poznan Declaration and monitor the progress towards meeting its objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suat. Uh, State Secretary Berger, would you have any immediate short remarks? Yeah, um, uh, thank you also to, to the three of you and um, minority rights. Uh, yeah, I think are absolutely crucial for, for any democratic uh, development that minorities are, are taken into account that they have uh, equal rights, equal access uh, on, in, in all areas. And I take your point that you see the necessity of having some kind of a monitoring. There is also um, uh, be beyond the European Union also the OECE, uh, which has a specific task of, of monitoring uh, minorities, which I think is, is also important. My understanding is that in the framework of the Berlin process, there is, to, is going to be a ministerial meeting on the specific challenges of, of the Roma. Um, uh, so I hope that the points you, you have presented here 
um, can also be discussed uh, with, with more depth uh, there. Um, when it comes to the legacies of the past, yeah, this is maybe, I don't know, the most, most difficult issue uh, and, and reconciliation. Uh, this is really, in my view, we can say it's a generational, generational challenge. And uh, I, I really hope that especially the young generation will be in a position to overcome, to overcome stereotypes, to overcome differences. And, and what you said about including also in a broader sense, Croatia, Slovenia, I think that is absolutely right. That, that needs to be done. And, uh, uh, and here we come back to the, to the media freedom. If we don't have free media, which can have really uh, an open uh, discussion and, and information about the past, about war crimes, uh, about the question of justice or the lack of justice, then immediately the whole discussion runs into uh, problems. And I, I very much take your point about cross-border. I think we should look at programs which are not uh, country specific, but which are in a broader sense and which forces people really to, to discuss uh, uh, not only the, the situation of their own country, but, but uh, uh, also of the, of the past. And I agree with the point zero tolerance against hate speech, zero tolerance uh, against uh, these kind of things. You know, obviously what we need on a political level, I would say, and, and that's where we put a lot of emphasis in now after the elections in Kosovo is that hopefully we can use this window of time till the elections in Serbia next, I think May, to, to make some progress here that both sides will engage constructively and in, in, in Bosnia, you might have seen that Germany has put forward a candidate for the office of the high representative. And you know, our idea um, with that is really a stronger engagement also in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the, the idea is really to overcome this, this political blockade along ethnic lines. And if, you, if we don't manage to overcome that, um, then I don't know how we can overcome this uh, divisive uh, nationalist rhetoric and, and politics. So it's a huge, huge task and, and challenge, but uh, it's, it's definitely high on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Berger. We are now moving on to the third cluster of working groups where uh, we will talk about enhancing integrity compliance in infrastructure projects and digitalization of public services uh, in terms of enhancing transparency, securing data protection. Uh, I already see Danilo and here is Ardian as well. Ardian Hakai from the Cooperation and Development Institute will update us on what the group dealing with enhancing integrity compliance in infrastructure projects has discussed. Ardian, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we have been discussing of how to shift the role of civil society organizations from a watchdog to owner, basically. Uh, but first, the challenges. Uh, we face uh, state capture. We face uh, ineptitude of public administration. We face increasing presence of third actors. And uh, also, we do not have for the moment a specific EU conditionality mechanism for the allocation of the economic and investment plan budget of 29 billion euros. So, our recommendations are in four clusters. Actually, we have another cluster ourselves. The first one regarding CSOs and think tanks. Uh, we want to bring together a critical mass of NGOs that are focused on monitoring, on contributing and exchanging expertise on integrity compliance and capital investment projects in Western countries. This is the first one, come together. The second one is that the NGOs, they must have as a key component of, every, of their work uh, to be monitored in all their projects the integrity compliance anytime that they work with the public administration. Basically, there is no point to work with uh, 
public administration partners without looking if they are able or if they're empty. The second recommendation goes for Western Balkan governments. Um, the, our governments or government institutions that are in charge of infrastructure should complete the adoption of integrity compliance plans as per national strategies, the EU obligations, and also international best practice. Uh, specialized NGOs should have observer status at national investment committee. Is the committee who decides which projects need to be financed or not. And also governments need to have obligatory consultation with civil society organizations on laws that impact infrastructure. Basically, we do not want any more special laws. They are very harmful for our budget and for our economy and democracy. Third, recommendations for EU and its member states. Basically, State Secretary, we would like very much to mainstream integrity compliance into the economic and investment plan and the 10 flagship projects. And actually, integrity compliance is also a conclusion of the Sofia summit last year. Second, uh, we want integrity compliance to be part of conditionality for the EU support of infrastructure project in Western Balkans. And we want the EU to regularly check if the institutions in charge of infrastructure are applying, are implementing their obligation regarding integrity. Second, we want a th third, sorry, we want representative from uh, NGOs, centers of excellence, NGOs that are that are proved that are worthy, to have an observer status at Western Balkans investment framework meetings. We want to see what's going on because we want to be closer to the information and have better transparency. And we want that uh, a long-term support for the civil society organizations that are involved in integrity compliance, not short-term, but long-term support. Infrastructure projects have a very long life cycle. And uh, we want this support to be part of the functioning budget of the WBIA. They have a big budget for consultancy. We would like a smaller budget for civil society organizations. Fourth, uh, for other actors, for international financial, financial institutions, uh, we would like them to provide accessible, adapted, and updated information for citizens and civil society or the infrastructure project that they finance. They provide it, but uh, it's quite difficult actually to get access to it. We want it to be much better organized and useful for us. And second and the last point, we want for IFI and also for the development agencies that Germany has, Denmark has, or development agencies to provide long-term support with expertise and financial resources to civil society organizations that are involved in monitoring integrity compliance in infrastructure projects. Thank you, that was all. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we now move on to Danilo Krivokapic from the SHARE Foundation, who's gonna update us on the work of the working group on digitalization in public services. Danilo, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Simonita, so much. Uh, just want to say hi to all the uh, panelists and attendees, and a special thanks to Secretary Berger for supporting this forum. So I I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, what was discussion in our uh, in our uh, group because these are a bit more emerging issues than the other one that we we heard here. So. I'm going to start with a cliche, and that that's that there are no longer borders between material and digital world. This became evident to everybody since pandemic started, and everybody had to adjust to live in this digital world. And that's what government did even before pandemic. So all of governments in the Western Balkans are uh, making strong digitalization efforts. They are trying to get more data from the citizens, but also to help them improve all of these services. This is also important for the our EU integration road because the in the Western Balkan Summit in Sofia, there was a consensus reached that these efforts are necessary in order to bring the uh, region closer to the EU path. So, uh, and 
there are many good things with uh, digitalization of these services, uh, but there are also some which are not so great. So uh, when we talked uh, from all countries, we could hear many examples of uh, massive data breaches, uh, data leaks. And uh, uh, what's worrying in this uh, situation is that uh, accountability is always missing. Uh, there are no penalties when this is happening. And sometimes this is just uh, the matter of what we call clumsy digitalization, let's say good intentions with little or no knowledge but sometimes uh, we are talking about this inherent need of government uh, to have uh, and misuse information in some cases what is uh, very important is uh, legal framework when we're talking about uh, data protection so uh, e european union gave us great standard uh, gdpr so it's it's not just that uh, we are on the road to EU that we need to adopt laws like GDPR, but GDPR is the golden standard in this uh, in this field, and uh, many of the countries already adopted laws uh, in line with GDPR. Other ones have that in their uh, agendas, but uh, implementations of these rules and enforcement of these rules is always uh, a big problem, and we need to work on that. On the other hand, I would just like to uh, mention a few of the opportunities and challenges when we are talking about the digitalization in public sector. One of them is digital literacy. There is no comprehensive analysis uh, on uh, how digital literal are citizens in the Western Balkans, but also what are the needs uh, for them in order to use digital services. Uh, also, the big opportunity when you're talking about digitalization is open data, information in open format. So um, uh, on one hand, the governments are not publishing uh, open data enough, but uh, there is also a problem on the demand side. So we in the civil sector, journalists, we don't know uh, still what to do with this data. And uh, at the end, uh, the very big problem is uh, user centricity of the services. So uh, these services needs to be built uh, so that people can use them. So uh, some uh, government service needs to be uh, at least as good as, uh, I don't know, e-banking, which everyone is using and can understand how it's used. Uh, I'm going to uh, go just briefly through the recommendations. I'm not going to read them all, but when we are talking about uh, recommendations for civil societies, it's uh, very important uh, for us to raise internal capacities in order to understand and deal with the issues re related to digitalization. But what is also very important, we should strive to work to together on a regional level in all these issues, uh, because all these issues in our countries are rather similar, and there are already some initiatives uh, working jointly on uh, digital rights. Uh, uh, for the government, let me just uh, point out a few. Uh, as I said, uh, governments should adopt comprehensive legal framework in the field of digitalization and data protection in line with EU standards, but as well as common standards for de developing e-services, guidelines for this optimization and implementation for the government. Uh, uh, other than that, it's very important uh, that government uh, should be guided by the principles of data protection and by design and by default when designing e-services, comprehensive risk analysis and impact assessment procedures should be undertaken and at various stages of design and development. And uh, lastly, uh, for the EU, I believe that the EU should continue to set golden standards uh, for tackling emerging, emerging issues in the use of, of advanced technology. Uh, at the moment, as I know, uh, regulation of um, uh, on uh, AI is in the process, which is very important. And uh, the other thing is that uh, EU should insist on the same level of accountability in the cases of data protection violations and incidents in our countries as for the member states, which is something that uh, some of the other panelists already mentioned. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Danilo. Before I give the opportunity to Secretary Berger, I just want to encourage the attendees of the event because we have more than 60 uh, besides the panelists, that it seems we will have time at the end of, in our uh, agenda for questions and comments. So if you want to write them in advance, if you already have questions, please do write them in the question and answer sessions. 
or we can shortly um, include you to pose a uh, an audio question possibly at the end of uh, the fourth cluster that uh, will follow. Sorry to have interrupted you, Secretary Berger. If you would like to respond on the integrity compliance and the digital agenda, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, before taking this job, I was the director general here for economic affairs. So I had a lot to do with infrastructure projects and uh, um, I, I, I very much understand your point and I, I really see also the necessity of a strong, very strong role, I would say, not only of civil society organizations, but also of independent media in, in, in monitoring these investment processes into, into infrastructure. And a, a lot depends, obviously, on, I think you mentioned it yourself, the question of transparency of processes. So, for example, in Germany, if we have an infrastructure uh, project, the government has to present it publicly, and then there is a certain time span for public debate about it, where a normal citizen, NGOs, everybody can, can come in and, 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 and move the discussion. And also the question of uh, who were the bidders, are all the, uh, all the, all the elements of, of, of a bidding process, are they transparent? Um, the question of anti-corruption, all of that is crucial. And then again, here we go to the question of independent media, of rule of law, of strong institutions in, in the area of, of anti-corruption. And um, so I think, yes, this is an issue also for, for, the, for the European Union. Um, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, I think we always have to look or should look at the added value for the whole region. So uh, if we speak about energy, the question of interconnectors, how can energy systems be connected, uh, road infrastructure, railway infrastructure, so how can we really make a gain not only for the country but for the region overall. And, um, obviously, to be in a position to monitor that effectively, a civil society organization needs a high degree of very specific knowledge. And so I understand your point. I don't know if there is fi financial, the possibility of financial support. I think it would be helpful, but it would also be helpful to connect to those NGOs, for example, here in Germany, in other parts of the European Union who are active in this field. Because my experience, for example, from the energy sector is you're only then effective if you have the in-depth knowledge. And that is maybe a little bit more than a civil society organization. It needs a little something like a think tank structure in order to have a, an, an understanding of energy systems, of infrastructure, but, but your point is, is very important. Digitalization, yeah. And here, I, I always say, look at one of the smallest member states of the European Union, Estonia, which is number one on digitalization, which shows to me that a, a government which is dedicated to move that issue forward, and to offer digital services to their citizens in a, in, a, in a reliable and responsible way can achieve a lot. And, and Estonia has shown that it's easier to do that than in a bigger country like, like Germany. And um, I think to, to, over, to, to overcome this question of maybe a lack of digital literacy that needs obviously investments in, in the necessary education um, uh, data protection, a very big issue, where, as you have said, I mean, the European Union is the standard setting in the world, I would say, on data protection. And that shows that uh, if you make good laws and, and are able to implement them, that you can do a lot. So here, I think accountability, what you mentioned, data breaches, a very big concern. 
uh, also here, I mean, the, the whole discussion we have about the regulation of platforms, uh, which, which, which is a big, big debate. How can we hold them accountable for their content? Um, uh, artificial intelligence you mentioned. So I would say in Germany, this is an ongoing process, an ongoing um, discussion, and whatever we can do here to support the digitalization in the Western Balkans, uh, uh, we should do that because this is an investment in the future. Thank you, Secretary Berger. Uh, we now move on to the fourth cluster of the working groups with a topic that I think is very close to everyone's hearts, which deals with uh, the green agenda. We have uh, three speakers, uh, one on energy transition, air pollution, and biodiversity and nature conservation. Uh, Nikat Harbas from the Regional Center for Sustainable Energy Transition will be the first speaker. And uh, Nikat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simonida. Thank you, State Secretary Berger, for having us here and an opportunity to present our thoughts regarding the energy transition in the Western Balkan countries. So within this working group, uh, which consisted of experts and activists from civil society organization and think tanks, we have discussed and elaborated how to strengthen the regional cooperation between civil society organizations. And the idea was to exchange actually the best practices for the approaching the energy transition in the region. Within the group, we have focused on green agenda for the Western Balkans and discussed the regional transition from first of all coal and other fossil, fossil fuels such as natural gas to renewable energy sources, as well as its potential and strategies for enhancing energy efficiency as a first. We have identified most important issue in energy transition process and prepare more than 550 policy recommendation for forum two focusing on three main areas, which already have been presented, CSOs, think tanks, Western Balkan governments, and of course, EU and member states. Some of them I will present now due to uh, time and most of them we will uh, actually have in writing. So the recommendation for uh, civil society and think tanks would be to continue to point out non-transparent work and corrupt actions in the field of energy to achieve the accountability of public authorities and the rule of law, which has been mentioned several times. Then cooperate with, with private sector in order to increase advocacy for appropriate policies, not just the public sectors, and involve media in the process because we have a lot of dialogue uh, on politics, on other topics, but not so much in energy transition topics, which is from our point of view, very important. Then to expand utilization of legal tools and instruments for the exposing the responsible politicians and economic actors actually to the legal and social responsibility such as energy community, Aarhus Convention, UN and, and et cetera. Talking about the government, uh, we think that the government should put the energy transition to the permanent and priority agenda on political activities. Given that that transition will have a significant impact on the transformation of the society and social relation in coming period. Energy transition towards renewables, focusing on upscaling solar and wind, first of all, and avoid stranded assets in new fossil fuels projects, uh, especially in coal and, of course, in natural gas. Include all uh, social actors in defining goals, priorities, the ordinary citizens as well, and plan activities to the energy transition process. Then create the policies and funds protecting both, not just jobs, but workers uh, in this energy transition coal region, especially, and set up the dates for coal phase out, because we still don't have the exact date for uh, Call phase out and, of course, abolish regulatory and administrative barriers for renewable energy development. Just one interesting uh, for constructing, for example, wind farm project, you have to obtain more than 150 permits, which is definitely taking the time 10 years, maybe. And recommendation for EU, some of them 
intensify the efforts to combat issue on, of corruption, which have been mentioned several times, clientelism as well, and lack of transparency and more closely integrate this effort with the activities surrounding generally the, the green agenda. Uh, compliance with EU laws and policies, in our point of view, must be a basic condition for all international donor, donor assistance, whatever donor fund development of strategic document or development of some specific document or other donor support. The EU should present itself as a credible partner by supporting the region with effective and robust financing structure that can offset funding for, uh, for fossil fuels in the region, such as from, from China, for example. And then strict uh, monitoring on use EU taxpayer funds, transfer of knowledge, which you already mentioned from EU to Balkan countries, which will be more than welcome. And last, uh, less carrot, more stick. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nihat. Uh, we now, from energy, move on to air pollution. And I would like to invite Alexandra Tomanich from the European Fund for the Balkans uh, to address us. Thank you very much, Simonida. I'm representing not only the European Fund for the Balkans, but also the Balkans United for Clean Air Network. Well, Mr. State Secretary, you said in your introductory words that um, we are here trying to find answers to questions of everyday life and to improve everyday life. When we speak about air, it can't be more everyday, it can't be more fundamental. We are living in the most polluted area of this continent. We face tremendous air pollution. Our cities figure uh, among the global top 10 most polluted cities on Earth. According to data of the World Health Organization, yearly we have approximately 14,000 deaths that can directly be linked to air pollution. So this is really not only a burning issue, but this is a very fundamental issue that is important to each and every one of us. Um, for the civil society, therefore, we think that we need to uh, see it as, a, as really the cross-cutting uh, topic that urgently needs to be addressed. We have uh, tremendous experts, uh, but also others. Um, we, we have had a campaign, a very successful awareness raising campaign, because we think that awareness and knowledge is the fundamental of actually being able to ask for accountability. We speak about air pollution in a level that it goes really to the core function of any state of being able to protect its citizens. So um, awareness raising campaigns uh, work with media and, and really educating the citizenry of what it means um, to have these, these numbers outside. Um, the government that has been mentioned uh, in all the other topics, they remain silent, they don't include uh, the experts that are there, they, they don't listen to, neither to the expert community nor to civil society. We are aware that uh, the, even the, the, the administrative capacities and the knowledge within the institutions is low, but there is a lot of knowledge available outside the institutions, but that knowledge has not been seen as knowledge of allies, but um, it's been framed as attacking progress and so on. So it's a very weird situation, but we even have the situation that uh, there are laws in place on the national level and that there are international obligations and that both are being breached. Um, so we definitely need your help and your focus on the situation on the ground but also on civil society that is there, but somehow fighting a very lonely fight. Um, the EU um, needs to include the Western Balkans in all its future climate activities and targets because they will not be reachable or not have any sense if the part of the continent polluting most and having heavily em emissions above all international target lines is, is left outside. We would also like to see uh, some sort of zero pollution conditionality when it comes to financing mechanisms now being prepared for the green agenda 
and maybe also have them when it comes to the instrument for pre-accession. Um, we just really need you to help and please do follow up what happens in the aftermath of these big international meetings because that is a big problem we see for all the topics. Whatever is uh, necessary is signed on the international stage, but back home the situation looks really unfortunately very different. Um, we have a number of uh, recommendations, especially to the national governments that go more into some procedural or technical issues, which I will not mention here. They will be available in written, um, but please just be aware of the situation that we are facing here and help us wherever you can to at least um, follow up and ask the questions that are not being heard when we ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, and thank you for reminding me uh, that uh, to answer to State Secretary Berger that we will provide all of these inputs in a written form because it was mentioned uh, before. And thanks for also uh, reminding us that you come also on behalf of the campaign Balkans United for Clean Air because it's something that I think has remained in uh, a lot of our uh, ears and minds. Uh, last uh, on the green agenda, I would like to invite Natasha Trnkovic uh, from the Center for Environment to update us on the discussions on biodiversity and nature conservation. Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Simonida. Thank you, uh, Secretary Berger, and thanks for all um, attendees. Uh, I will present the recommendation that we developed in the Biodiversity and Nature Conservation uh, Working Group. Uh, as I guess we are all aware, biodiversity is a huge threat globally, and there are many efforts with uh, not so big results. Unfortunately, uh, Western Balkan is not any exception. So biodiversity is really threatened in our region too. However, we still have opportunity to protect our pristine forests, our free flowing rivers, still um, uh, unpolluted soil and all other resources that we still have and that are still uh, to a large extent uh, in better conditions than in the rest of the Europe. Also, we have uh, quite stable populations and really good and healthy uh, habitats of many uh, wildlife species. Uh, by protecting the nature, of course, we are not protecting all the only flora, fauna and fungi, but also we uh, protect people, we protect uh, their communities, also their economies that we often forget how closely it is connected, uh, habitats, uh, traditions and also, of course, potential to develop in a sustainable way. Uh, recommendations, as all of my colleagues, I'll present in different clusters. So first uh, are those that are recommendations for CSOs and think tanks. Uh, and of course, I'll just uh, uh, highlight a few of them. Uh, CSOs working on the nature conservation should take part in the development of the action plan and roadmaps for the implementation of the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans that will be coordinated by the Regional Cooperation Council. Uh, in this regard, we will also, as, uh, as a group of um, uh, organizations that are working uh, strongly on the national level, also on the re uh, regional level, we will encourage local CSOs to take an active part. And then to strengthen a uh, Bionet network that is existing and really good, uh, positive uh, example of the networking in the region, but also other relevant networks like CNET and different coalitions 27 that are active in the region to involve um, in the development of the regional biodiversity strategy, but also all other uh, relevant uh, processes, to publish a regional shadow report on the implementation of the biodiversity uh, policies and the general progress with the coordination of the already mentioned Bionet network uh, members. And then to keep its, of course, already uh, well-known watchdog role uh, as all in all other policymaking and negoci negotiation processes. Recommendations for the Western Balkan governments are to have professional staff in the protected areas and in scientific governmental institutions, and they should be merit-based and adequately uh, qualified receiving the regular trainings. We, of course, all, we, uh, all of us, we really often mention the lack of capacities 
uh, but to some extent we cannot uh, ignore it anymore and we really seek the the really good uh, and quick uh, measures in this regard then to appoint relevant and qualified focal points for the nature uh, related conventions this is also uh, really crucial topic then to increase the intersectoral cooperation by organizing a round table on the sustainable farming and biodiversity in the biodiversity uh, important areas not only protected areas to introduce the financial financial scheme uh, green direct payments which support uh, farmers who adopt and maintain environment and climate friendly farming a moratorium on hydropower plants across the western balkans I guess this is really uh, ongoing and really present topic, uh, so I don't think that I should uh, elaborate this more. Uh, and there are also in different countries, there are different initiatives that are going in a uh, in direction of moratorium or a total ban on, on hydropower energy, increasing the quality uh, and the standard for the environmental impact assessment, but also uh, for, the, for the involvement of CSOs. Uh, to increase uh, percentage of the protected areas by 30% in accordance with the UN new post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework and also EU biodiversity strategy until 2030. Uh, to fully uh, uh, trans uh, to have fully transposition of the habitat and birds directives in the national legislation to improve sectoral cooperation and maintain uh, mainstreaming of biodiversity in the sectoral policies like energy, agriculture, water, management, forestry, spatial planning, and etc. And to recognize and value the contribution of civil society organizations in the nature conservation sector and to enhance opportunities for them to participate in decision making processes. Uh, and then last but not least, definitely recommendations for the EU, its member states to recognize and support the work of national con uh, conservation CSOs and regional networks to sanction Western Balkan governments when not responding or not giving the adequate answers to, uh, for example, uh, Bern Convention or other convention uh, secretariats. Uh, to strengthen the European Commission's monitoring on nature protection in Western Balkan countries and to provide more effective support to Western Balkan governments in order to achieve EU standards in biodiversity conservation and public participation in decision making without further delays. Uh, and to create mechanism for EU investments in the Western Balkans in order to secure that those will boost the biodiversity and nature conservation, not threaten them. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I know this is the last group, but I would like to, and Natasha was concerned that whether she would have the time, but we were very uh, disciplined. I would like now to give the floor to Secretary Berger to respond to uh, this cluster. And then I will pose a couple of questions that we've also collected for your uh, concluding remarks. But uh, if, for first, the cluster on the green agenda. Yeah, thank you also to the three of, of you. And I must admit that I was not aware about how serious the question of air pollution is. Uh, so uh, that, that was really um, uh, an important, important point. And you, you know, we just, uh, we just approved in the European Union now uh, the necessary funding for this recovery program to get out of the of the COVID crisis. And as you, I'm sure you know that the full focus will be on digital, but more than that on, on, on green recovery in the sense that we don't want to use the money to go back to the old industrial structures, but we want to invest in the new ones. And, and I, I, I've seen that, for example, um, in, in your region, 80% of the energy is still carbon-based. So the challenge is huge. And, and obviously, and I know that from the debate we have here in Germany, which has all, also not been, not been very easy over the last 20, 20, 30 years, that um, you need to convince people. And, and uh, obviously, the question of jobs is a very important one. So how to do a green transition without losing public support when it comes to energy prices, 
when it comes to jobs, because all transformation processes create fears, create concerns. And for example, here in Germany, um, we have taken the decision now to phase out coal, but the same will happen in, in coal relying countries like Poland and others, where the impact will be, will be even much stronger. So we need a policy which offers then new opportunities, no, new possibilities in order not to lose public support on that. And overall, you know, my feeling is that with the new US administration, um, they coming back to the Paris Climate Agreement, that the fact that we have now a growing international alliance to get out of the financing of coal power plants, and the last two to join yesterday were two days ago, Korea and Japan. So it's only China which is left. The fact that we all want to become climate neutral till 2050, all of that will generate a power of transformation which will affect all, all the areas you mentioned. And I'm sure that with, for example, the, the EU investment plan and many other, many other instruments, um, this transformation which is going to take place within the European Union will definitely have a positive impact on, on the Western Balkans. Um, when it comes to the, to the challenges um, on the ground, yes, uh, energy efficiency, very important. Um, also uh, emission trading systems, uh, I think that is something that needs to be, to be built up. But it's interesting to see that um, the cross-cutting issue of what we are discussing today is always accountability. It's always the rule of law. It's always the possibility that civil society is included in the processes, that civil society is heard, and, and that tra transparency in the processes is increased. But also uh, what, what you mentioned when you spoke about biodiversity, the question, of, of adequate uh, staffing. You need people who really have an expertise on, 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 on the different uh, issues in order to take the right policy, the right policy decisions. And biodiversity is obviously also here a big issue and not an easy one. How to balance the interests of agriculture with the interest of maintaining biodiversity. And this is a a tough fight between, between, between different positions where civil society, at least here in, in Germany, is playing really a, a, a crucial role. So I would really, uh, seeing also uh, the, 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 the spirit uh, you have, the work you are doing, I think very important, uh, and some of you mentioned it, the networking within the region, but also the networking with think tanks, and civil society organizations in within the European Union. But I must say on all three points, um, I would say we, I am pretty optimistic that the push which will come out of the international debate of the transformation within the European Union will have a, a fundamental positive impact also on the Western Balkans. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Berger. Uh, we are very wary of your time, but before we, I give you the concluding remarks, I would like to thank all of the colleagues that uh, presented the work of the working groups, also all of the participants. We have more than 70 with us uh, today. Uh, I think for us, this is, is, I think from all of the presentation, you got the sense of how important uh, this exchange is for us. And uh, I would like just to ask you in your concluding remarks, if you can maybe give us, although you hinted a bit on it, recommendations on how we can maybe present these issues better to EU-based stakeholders from uh, looking from the uh, outside in. And there was a specific question that from Milena Lazarevich, if you can um, reflect whether Germany would support the inclusion of the Western Balkans in the representative strand of the Convention on the Future uh, of Europe, in addition to the civil society side, because we understand that it is very important for governments to be observers, active observers in these discussions with their um, EU peers. 
Um, now, the, the how long your concluding remarks will be depend on you because we are also wary uh, of your time, but thank you uh, very much. And just so that everyone knows, after Secretary Berger, we will hand over for a minute or two to Valeska to wrap up, so do not leave. Secretary Berger, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I must say, I, I really enjoyed this one and a half hours of uh, of discussion on, on, on these many topics. And uh, uh, it was interesting for me to see that many of the concerns you have of the issues you discuss um, are, are absolutely the same as, as we are discussing internally. Although you have the additional challenges, I would say, um, and, and this is, I think, something we have to take very serious on what we can do to strengthen the voice uh, of the citizens, the voice of the civil society in the processes. And as I said before, um, if, if you look at, at, at the different areas we have discussed today, um, it, it really comes down to some basic questions, uh, which is the participation of civil society in the decision-making processes. Um, the role of parliaments was mentioned, um, the role of the media, of independent media, the role of, of, of cooperation with, within the region, the question of rule of law, of anti-corruption, um, of uh, accountability in, in, in general. And um, uh, so it shows really very clearly this discussion today where the focus where the focus has to lie and if you have accountability in general in a government then it immediately uh, affects all 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 areas so i would say it would be it would be very positive if from from your 10 working groups um, uh, you would make this recommendations in a in a in a written form and I would suggest not to go into too many details. Really um, highlight in, in the 10 areas, what are your, I don't know, five, six, maximum 10 key concerns. Um, uh, and, and really also with a, with a political view. And, and this is something that, that we can uh, then try to, to, to work with. And conference of the future of Europe, yes, I mean, the, the point is the mandate is done. So the governments which participate are from, from the member states, but the debate is with civil society. And, and uh, uh, I have heard now from, from different sides, and, and we share that the need to include the, the, the Western Balkans and all the areas you addressed here, many of them relate to the questions we want to discuss in this, uh, in this uh, process on, on the future of Europe. Because the basic question we want to discuss there is what kind of Europe, of European Union, do we want to have in 10, 15 years? Where do we want to stay on, on green transition, uh, on strategic autonomy? What can we do to be in 15 years still an independent actor when it comes to our economy, to our health systems? What can we do not to be dependent uh, from China, from other uh, important international actors and maintain the capacity of Europe and the European Union uh, to, be, to be an independent international actor? And, and as I said, many of the issues I think we have discussed today have a lot to do with this debate on the Conference of the Future of Europe. So we are going to see how we can do it. This process ends uh, in the French presidency in spring next year. So I hope that we can organize and find a way how to include all of you in, in this debate. But thank you very much really for the invitation. It was was also for me very interesting to hear your concerns and your your suggestions and and really uh, all the best and you can count on our support for your future work. Thank you, thank you for your kind words. We release you off duty four minutes uh, late and now I can go uh, hand over to Valeska.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simonida. And thank you to all of you. What, what a rich panel and insight into your work over the past years. And as was mentioned before, uh, we will receive um, all of the results and put them together in one document and share it throughout. And on behalf of our team of organizers from Southeast Europe Association, Aspen, Germany, I would like to really use this opportunity also from our side to, to thank you, State Secretary Berger, for taking the time and, and to, for providing feedback on the uh, recommendations that civil society organizations from across the region have worked on over the past days we as as, as Simonia said we are we are mindful of your time so so please feel free to 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 leave even before the official conclusion uh, of this panel um, thank you very much once again um, I would also like to use this opportunity to thank all of the facilitators uh, of the working groups um, for the work um, that you put into the preparations um, not only of the working groups themselves but also uh, the summary of the recommendations and you have contributed the papers that uh, that everyone can find in the library and this will also remain open throughout the next week so if you haven't had a chance yet you you can still have a look uh, Simonida, I would really like to thank you once again uh, for jumping into this panel at the very last minute. Um, thank you for taking this, uh, this um, responsibility. I would like to thank the German Chancellery and especially the Foreign Office, not only for entrusting us with the organization of this forum, but also the support that they have given us uh, throughout the process of, of the preparations. I would like to thank European Western Balkans for, for serving as media partner for, for the forum. Um, I would like to thank all speakers and moderators who have been part of the panels throughout the past two days. Um, I would also like to use this opportunity to thank the creator and host of this great platform. I don't know if he's hearing us as well, but Gaston Geilen, we are very happy with, with what you set up um, and, and I think this has been great. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Victoria Palm, Tina Borius, and Richard Kaufmann, who have been in the background invisibly um, the past two days, making sure everything runs smoothly. And I dare say, I would like to most importantly thank Yannick Remme, who was the person where all the threads um, of the preparations have been coming together in the past weeks. Uh, thank you so much for the great job that you have done. Thanks to every single one of you for your participation. And as mentioned already yesterday, please keep your login information. You can already find the first recordings of panels that you might have missed on the platform now, and they will be completed shortly. Uh, moreover, the second part of this year's Civil Society and Think Tank Forum will take place on July 5th right here, and you will be able to reuse your access to this platform to participate in it. Um, as the conference on the future of Europe was mentioned several times, um, there is also still a lot of room for your ideas on the idea board that we have integrated on the conference on the future of Europe. The reason why we have this board is that we have observed a high interest in the region, and it was expressed uh, several times um, today again, of being involved in the conference on the future of Europe. And while we, of course, uh, cannot change the scope of this official process, we do agree that ideas coming from the region should also be heard. Therefore, we are planning to feed these ideas into the official channels of the Conference on the Future of Europe on behalf of the region as a way of including also your ideas uh, coming, coming from the region. We will also take these ideas as a basis to see what else it is that we as organizers of this forum can do um, on our end about this. So um, we will keep this idea board open until the end of next week um, and would be very happy to see all of you take the time also to share your ideas uh, on the board. You can access it by either clicking on the plane or the, uh, on the picture or by choosing um, the ideas future of Europe in the menu. We really hope that uh, to have all of you with us again in July. And with that, um, I have the pleasure of closing the first part of this year's Civil Society and Think Tank Forum. Thank you very much once again and have a great afternoon.